What's happening, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Noah, and this is Bunk Bed Breakdowns. Unfortunately, there's no bunk bed behind me because Yukon is full quarantine and the whole place is shut down, <laughs> so you're not going to be able to see that beautiful backdrop, but what you will be able to see is Mike's beautiful face because he's on here every single week with me. Mike, this has been one of the craziest free agent weeks, weekends, whatever you want to call it, that I could remember. Maybe it's because I'm like 15 years old and I don't have <laughs> my cranium fully developed, but what are your thoughts? Do you think Tom Brady's coming back? Just hit us with some some bold takes. Uh, yeah, it's definitely been one of the crazier ones. And we already know Tom Brady's not coming back. He already uh, released, dropped that on Twitter. So we know he's going somewhere else. I think speculation is maybe the Bucks. But yeah, it's been crazy, especially at the quarterback position, right? You never, you. never I think this is the first time ever that I can remember where there's an oversupply of starting quarterbacks. That like never happens, right? Like yeah, well, when you call like, Teddy Bridgewater a starting quarterback, then there's always going to be an oversupply because you're really getting loose with that term. But, yeah, people are moving. DeAndre Hopkins is getting traded for a bag of chips that would get vetoed in, like, <laughs> 9 out of 10 dynasty leagues all over the place. But that's not the concern of the show. If there is some free agency news, we'll probably break it. But it's going to be, like, what, 16 hours late because we're doing this on Tuesday and it's releasing Wednesday morning. But the focus of today's show is Mike took a little bit of a deep dive into the running back landscape looking at – team's cap spaces, how many picks that they have in the upcoming draft. We had to tweak it recently because of what has happened in free agency. Uh, these picks that, you know, Houston was trading were kind of disgusting what they got in return for DeAndre Hopkins. So things got adjusted. We're going to be talking about who is potentially in play for a rookie running back, while others you may think are good spots for rookie running backs, but the way that their books line up or the picks that they have don't really bear that out. So without further ado, let's head into the deep digging of analysis. So basically what we wanted to look at is, you know, every year there's a lot of rookie hype. You know, we have all these workhorse running backs with three down skill sets that we think are going to be fantasy studs. And in reality, uh, we just wanted to look at how many actual free spots there are, right? Like you can be as good as you want, but if there's no starting job, then you're not going to produce fantasy points. So we kind of broke the process down into a couple different factors. Uh, first thing we looked at was salary cap. So how much room does that team have to sign on free agents? Because, you know, if they have a lot of money and they're a heavy contender, you know, they could definitely invest in running back via free agency versus the draft. And then obviously we looked at the draft capital in the top three rounds. So how many draft picks this team, these teams have. And I think what you'll find there is it's pretty revealing because a lot of these top top landing spots that we all want running backs to go to, uh, they might not be in the best situations or have the available resources to invest in that space, right? And then the last thing we want to look at was the vacated opportunities. So of the running backs that have left, you know, how many touches are available for the taking? And that kind of helps us illuminate whether we think there is a potential committee role or a workhorse role. So that's kind of how we looked at it on the high level. Uh, we're just going to jump right into it uh, team by team. First up, Miami Dolphins. Um, what, what are your thoughts here? I know you just broke some news uh, to me on text. Uh, why don't you share with the viewers what, what happened? Yeah, if you guys haven't heard it yet, then I suggest you download Twitter. But Jordan Howard <laughs> just signed with the Miami Dolphins, which basically means we are probably going to see a very similar situation to last year where Miles Sanders was brought into Philadelphia. We kind of had to back him up for most of the season. If he didn't get injured, I'm not so sure Miles Sanders would have broken out. But you know, prior to this news, that's a team that we expected to have a workhorse rookie running back come in because they had so many picks. I believe they had six in the first three rounds. They did have a ton of cap, but they've been spending that on guys like Eric Flowers, a bunch of uh, defensive players like Byron Jones. Somehow they have like a keep to leave from last year. So we were expecting them to maybe bring in a J.K. Dobbins, a DeAndre Swift in the first or second rounds. But now that they have Jordan Howard there, not that I'm completely tempering expectations for a true workhorse in this backfield. I just think that the situation isn't as good as it could have been because if, at least if you're a workhorse, right, what you chase in fantasy football is volume and opportunity. Although they had a terrible offensive line last year, they were 32nd in adjusted line yards and they had three starters that are unrestricted free agents. They did just bring in Eric Flowers, but even then he was the 30th graded uh, guard last year out of 80. So the situation wasn't great. I looked back at Chan Gailey how often he throws to his running back over the past six years, I believe, if I can count correctly. He targeted the running back 21%, 19, 21, 20.6, 16.4, and 12.4% of the time. And that's despite having C.J. Spiller, Fred Jackson, Jamal Charles, Matt Forte, Bilal Powell, 
he had a ton of players that were really good pass catchers and that just wasn't a part of the game that he was, you know, using them heavily. So I think taking both things into consideration, now that Jordan Howard is in the fold, who's probably going to be the goal line back, unless they get, you know, a Jonathan Taylor or a J.K. Dobbins. I don't know. I'm kind of tempering expectations for whichever rookie running back lands there. I do like what Miami is doing. I think they're a few years out from being playoff contenders, especially now that Tom Brady's out of the AFC East. But I think the Bills are still going to roll the AFC East now. And I don't know. If if Swift goes there, he's probably still my 101. But if Jonathan Taylor lands in any spot other than Miami, it's going to be hard for me to not move him ahead of him. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. But like you said, I kind of like Miami as well. I mean, they have they have stockpiled a ton of picks. They have three picks in the first round, two picks in the second round, which is like probably prime for trying to land someone like J.K. Dobbins, which there's been some like hype building on that actually recently. And then they also have a third round pick. And they're despite spending a bunch of money on defense, they've just been like buying up every single defensive asset. They're still like third in the league in cap space. So, you know, we expect one of those picks to get allocated to Tua, which again is great for their future outlook. Uh, he's a stud quarterback. But if you look at the vacated opportunities, we have Drake and Walton gone. So they accounted for about 100 carries and 54 targets for 154 total. And then you got the, the trash, trash can, Kalen Balaj left. Uh, Patrick three Musketeers, Balaj, yeah. Laird, and Gaskin. Probably one yeah. of the worst running back three-headed <laughs> monsters I've ever seen. Definitely horrible. So together they combine for 172 uh, carries and 66 targets. So the total you're looking at about 400 total touches, right? Jordan Howard's going to go in there, and you know he's going to eat up a lot of like that goal line touches, some of the more valuable touches. You'd probably expect him to get somewhere close to what he did in Philly, right? Probably like 100. About like to, 200 touches, right? Like 12, yeah. 13 carries a game. Yeah, exactly. So you're left with about 200 touches uh, per game. So that's by no means a workhorse back. So I think you kind of nailed it on the head is it's going to take, you know, possibly an injury to Jordan Howard uh, in order for someone to really emerge that true workhorse back. We originally had this spot as a workhorse uh, opportunity, but we changed it to a committee and not because we think Jordan Howard is a stud, but, you know, if anything, we've seen that coaching tendencies tend to be I don't know, would you call this stubborn, right? He came from New England. Um, so, Gailey, old school. Larry yeah. Johnson, like 500 carries one season. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we're, we're going to see what happens, but I would definitely temper expectations, um, even if Swift goes there. Uh, despite the talent, you know, situation does matter and opportunity is king. So One thing, I'm not sure if we brought this up, but the, like basically the whole premise of this video is to put into perspective, like the value of an early rookie pick. You may think that these guys are just going to land in prime you know, prime uh, running back landing spots. And that's just not always the case. We just wrote off the Dolphins. We've seen Tennessee kind of go to shit with Derrick Henry resigning Arizona. Those were two other spots that we expected a workhorse role. And they kind of, you know, disappeared. And as we go through this list, you'll see that there, I think there are only three left where we expect a true workhorse and not even all of those look to be rookie picks. Yeah, man. It's like that. Uh, it's like that usual suspects meme where Kevin, where uh, he's just like, just like gone. Man. Yeah. Just gone, dude. <laughs> the greatest trick fantasy <laughs> football ever pulled was convincing the world. Every 101 to 104 was a rookie. <laughs> <Of course. rookie. laughs> yeah. All right. Next up, we got the Bills. This is an interesting one. I mean, they just signed a massive, uh, not signed, sorry. They just traded for a massive asset in Stephon Diggs to really help out that wide receiver core. They really needed it. And, you know, we know Tom Brady's gone. So for the first time in like two decades, the AFC uh, is wide open in that division for the Bills. And I, I'd say they're probably, you know, in the running for the best team of the division, right? What do you think? I think dude, they're so interesting. The AFC East is like actually interesting now because the Patriots aren't just going to sh- are shoe in for the number one seed there. They aren't a shoe in for the bye. The Bills have a dangerous team. We know their defense is good. Their offense is building weapons. Last year, Cole Beasley was, like, sneaky good. They have a pretty decent wide receiver trio there. Devin Singletary is promising. Dawson Knox is promising. And we're, what we're about to touch on, the amount of cast base that they still have, they could add maybe a Melvin Gordon and just, mm-hmm. you know, completely revamp this offense and be one of the better units in the NFL. I know that's crazy to, like, to say, but for fantasy purposes at least, like, I'm not afraid of investing in Bill's players. No, 100%, man. Like you, just, you just touched on it, too. So we have them tag as a committee opportunity right now. Um, but they did lose the draft picks. So all they have is a second round and a third round pick. So they're a bit more limited there. And like Noah said, they're number four in cap space with about $52.6 million. And they're definitely heavy playoff contenders. I mean, they almost beat the Texans, but they somehow found a way to throw the game more than Billy O.B. did. I think um, it was that lateral that Josh Allen threw like 50 <laughs> yards behind yeah. us in Dawson Knox. Yeah. 
Exactly. Gordon and Yeldon are gone, so they vacate about 214 total touches. Singletary is still there. So if they draft someone like an A.J. Dillon, you know, you're looking at a committee backfield, right, which is a very likely scenario. But I think what's something we can't write off is if they do sign Melvin Gordon, who is the big name free agent workhorse running back left, because they're really, you know, missing that one piece, right? If they do sign Gordon, like Singletary Stonks is going to be, you know, into the in, deep into the shitter, I would say. So, yeah, looking at the Bills picks right now, they have 54 and 86. So 54 is the only one that I could realistically see them taking a running back that would supplant Devin Singletary. I mean, 86, you'd have to hope like Cam Akers falls that far to get a running back, you know, talent-wise that's better than Devin Singletary. But as Mike said, right, they have a ton of cap space. We know that Melvin Gordon, there's like a 99% chance he's not going back to the Chargers. If he lands there, I'm not saying Devin Singletary is completely useless in fantasy, but we know Melvin Gordon can catch passes. He's a better goal line back than Singletary. And that's not like hyperbole. We saw Frank Gore take that job or hold off Devin Singletary on the goal line last year, which yep. shouldn't be possible. So, yeah, I'm a little bit worried for him. But if they come out of free agency and they go into the draft with basically only Devin Singletary, I don't know. I think he could be like sneaky RB1. Like probably not sneaky. Everybody's going to expect it at that point. But like he was incredible in college. This year he was incredible when on the field. I know we kind of want to write him off as being a workhorse because of his size, but, like, why? We've seen a bunch of smaller running backs do really well in college. He handled the load. Sure, maybe he's not the best goal line back, but he's somebody that we know from his time at FAU could catch passes. He's really efficient on the ground. He's just not some breakaway speed player. So, yeah, I'm excited for him. Maybe not – Oh, it's not always going to end up uh, by the end of this free agency period that he's going to be a lead back, but if he is – I just want yeah. to see what people are willing to trade for him because I think you get like super interesting people trading like top five rookie picks. Oh, a hundred percent. I could, I mean, people are already trading like, you know, 1.08, like 1.07 for Singletary. So I could definitely see that, you know, for me, it's just it comes down to like a risk mitigation thing where, you know, if they sign Gordon, like his value is like basically non-existent. If they don't, then he's like really good. But like, the middle ground's kind of like meh, whatever. Yeah, I wouldn't be buying him right now. That's how yeah. we put it. Yeah, definitely don't buy. So I mean, we have it projected as them signing a free agent um, into a committee role, but be on the lookout for Melvin Gordon there. Number three, thankfully, there are still some workhorse jobs available. We got the Tampa Bay Bucks. Rumor in Rojo. So <laughs> rumored that Tom Brady's going to go there. We'll see what happens if he does go there. That's damn fine for the running back position, especially if they get anyone that catches passes. But let's give a quick recap. Bucks are number two in cap space. Uh, that's a little bit misleading because they're going to have to address the quarterback positions. That's going to eat up a, a big chunk of that money. Um, and then they have their basically their normal draft picks in the first, second, and third round. We currently we had them projected as a free agent, so I actually thought you know Kenyon Drake would have been a great target there. Melvin Gordon still a great candidate for that. Um, you know, Arians really likes to have veteran guys. You know, he's not a big fan of the young guys. I mean, he literally benched Rojo for the entire game because he missed one pass pro. He brought back Andre week. Ellington last year. I didn't even like, know yeah. that guy could still lace him up. I know. It cost me like $1,000 in DFS that week. <laughs> Pretty painful. But what do you think, Noah? Like, what, what, is your, what is your outlook on Tampa Bay Bucks? Do you like that landing spot? Who do you like going there? What do you I think? don't know. I, I didn't look into them too much because I kind of still expect Rojo to get his. I mean, he wasn't completely terrible last year. I know he can't block for shit and he's not a good pass catcher. So maybe he takes over that kind of Peyton Barber change of pace, except he's a little bit faster than Barber. I wouldn't mm -hmm. be surprised if they go after a rookie. I mean, they pick 14. That's way too rich for my blood. But pick 45, that's, you know, around Prime. Cam Akers territory. If they bring in Akers, Bruce Aarons will then have a running back that he can trust out of the backfield as not only somebody that can catch passes, that can protect his quarterback. And if Tom Brady's there, you know Tom Brady is going to tell Bruce Arians to keep somebody on the field that's not going to get him crushed. So I like that spot for a rookie if they want to spend the, you know, pick number 45 on it. But I wouldn't be surprised if after they pay a quarterback, they just go after like a Carlos Hyde or something to get you know, <laughs> two stupid ass thumpers that aren't going to do anything for you and just be the Bucks being the Bucks. But if Tom Brady has any say in things, I'd, I'd assume that he wants to go after somebody that can actually be a threat out of the backfield. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that would turn that would be brutal if they went over Carlos Carlos Hyde because that would turn a workhorse role into a committee role yet again. Mm -hmm. But in terms of vacated opportunities, I mean, Barber's leaving. That's about 178 touches. And then of the guys left between Jones and Ogumba Wale, there's about 183 carries and 86 targets. So they do target the backfield quite a bit. So if someone does happen to walk into three down three down roll there, you're looking at a pretty damn good fantasy asset. 
442. Like their offensive ball. line isn't great, but that's an offense that gets down and around the red zone and the end zone a ton. And they throw to their like their percentage of throws to the running backs aren't extremely high, but since they throw so much, the percentage and the volume offset to where they're actually throwing a ton to the running back, like you just said. So if they do get like an Edward Hilaire or an Acres, I don't know, stonks or through the roof. That's like an easy one oh three pick right there. Definitely, definitely. So that kind of wraps up for the Bucks. Next up, we got the Horsemen, the Denver Broncos. They have a pretty interesting situation. I mean, the team has basically come out and just took a giant dump on Freeman and said, hey, we want to find a complimentary pack for Philip Lindsay. So, you know, Freeman is basically not going to be very useful. He's going to be, I guess, uh, what, Monte Ball 2.0. And Damn, you'd have to do them like that. I'm on to <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they have an interesting cap situation. So, uh, they have, they're about 13th with 38 million in cap space, but they have a first round pick, a second round pack round pick and three third round picks. So I think it's pretty damn likely they're going to land someone in that third round pick to kind of complement that role. What do you think they're looking for? Like, what would you think they'd be targeting with that? It's strange because Philip Lindsay doesn't play like you would expect Philip Lindsay to play, right? He's like 5'10", 185 pounds, but he's like a between the tackles, one cut type of guy. He hasn't been able to be used effectively in the passing game. Royce Freeman, I think, had more or about the same amount of targets this year, which is very surprising. Philip Lindsay was still being used on the goal line heavily. So I'm not even sure what this team wants. Maybe they want a fat running back and catch passes. So maybe they tell, you know, Benjamin to go back up to his pro day weight or whatever. Uh, looking at their third round, they have like a cluster of picks. They have 77, 83, and 95. They also have the 46th pick um, in the second round. Not the 46th in the second round, but 46th overall. If they miss on a running back there and they just want to attack in the third round, honestly, like I was joking, but Eno Benjamin at that spot yeah. isn't terrible. Um, That's exactly who I was thinking about, too. Even like maybe a Keyshawn Vaughn, basically Royce Freeman yeah. 2.0 and maybe see if that works. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I I think, you know, Benjamin's a really, a really good one because, I mean, that's a pretty good pass catcher. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, Clyde Edwards or Lair is another one that comes to mind, but that would probably cost more than the second round pick. But if CH does fall to the third round, um, I mean, they got a lot of capital in that space, so I could totally see them making that move. Yeah, and I'm not an expert on Broncos offensive line, but I'm pretty sure they're pretty young and they just brought in, I think it was Graham Glasgow through free agency. They were like a middle of the pack unit. They could start to move up you know, in terms of adjusted line yards. And, and Eno Benjamin, who might not have the best vision in the world, could even do pretty well behind there. So, you know, I actually <laughs> kind of like that spot for uh, Eno Benjamin. He could sneak into the first round if he lands there because I'm not so sure that Philip Lindsay is just a pure better player than him in terms of real life and also in fantasy because Eno Benjamin would easily take over that pass catching role. And what's yeah. to say he isn't going to be on the goal line too. Yeah, get about 80 targets. That'd be a pretty decent asset to have. All right, next up. Um, Noah's favorite team, future home of Justin Herbert, Los Angeles Chargers. So we know that they signed. When you said my favorite team, I looked at the spreadsheet, and the next team I saw was the Lions. Like, what's he about to say about the fucking Lions? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so I mean, Eckler, you know, or your boy signed a big deal. Not a big deal. I mean, not like you know, fran- like, like franchise. Yeah, it's still pretty damn good money for running backs. And, dude, good for him, man. What a story, right? Undrafted free agent, uh, super jacked upper body. Probably doesn't work out his legs that much based on the picture. But No, I saw – dude, one time I looked up his highlights. I just typed in Austin Eckler. He has his own YouTube channel. The boy's squatting like 500 on the day. (laughs) Yeah, I'm just kidding. He's a beast. Uh, (laughs) We love that. We love that for Austin Eckler, the running back two of 2019 uh I, i'm kind of like shocked that people were like so quick to just kick him into that R- low rb2 range it's like dude this guy literally just finished his rb2 he signed i still like him i think the window to buy him is going to open up again because i fully believe that the chargers do like to run a committee um and i think that's also good for eckler you know we don't need everyone to be a workhorse that's what people understand right we don't want everyone to have 300 touches guys like kamara guys like aaron jones guys like eckler they're incredibly efficient with their touches and we like that for them so but we do see the potential for a committee back right so gordon left about 162 carries and 55 targets so about 200 plus touches available i'm sure some of that will go to eckler because they did pay him but there's still room for someone else. Do you think that's going to be taken up by Jackson, or do you think they will invest in a rookie? I think a little bit by Jackson because Jackson has looked really good when on the field, but he's not somebody that's going to be able to work in a tandem, in my opinion, with Austin Eckler throughout the entire season. They have picked 6, 37, 71, 112. Honestly, at 112, if like A.J. Dillon is there, I'm, he'll probably go higher because Bam. of his combine showing, but I wouldn't hate that. Just keeping Austin Eckler healthy by not running mm-hmm. him in between the tackles 15 times a game. I wouldn't mind that. Just give him basically every carry that Melvin Gordon had. 
and then just let him let Austin Eckler overtake a lot of those targets that Melvin Gordon frees up. You look at 2018 too, right? Austin Eckler, I believe, was the 26 RB26 on a point per game basis, and that's with yep. Melvin Gordon playing most of the season. There was only like three games Austin Eckler started. So, as you said, he's one of those guys that doesn't need a ton of volume to produce. He's just super efficient on all the touches. If you just go on Twitter and type in Austin Eckler and then like PFF, they'll have charts and stuff, and he's like first in yards per route run yep. for a running back, first in yards after contact per carry. He's just such a good running back. This offensive line. They just traded their like 39 year old left tackle for 26 year old left guard who's been to like, think, yeah, like five Pro Bowls. So that's pretty good. I honestly think that if they land a good quarterback through free agency, which is pretty possible, I'm pretty sure, what are they, 13th? They're 12th in cap space. If they land a quarterback through free agency, I could see them spending that first round pick on like a left tackle and just completely beefing up that offensive line, which would not only be great for Austin Eckler to have, you know, space to run behind but also this just offense as a whole, because that's been such a weak point for them over for as long as I could remember is that offensive line. So if those things get shored up, they have a ton of weapons on the outside. Hopefully the efficiency as a whole in this offense improves. And even if he's not the goal linebacker, he's still a threat to score through the receiving game. Dude, they have 39 million, um, sixth overall pick. Dude, could you imagine if Brady goes there, Brady to Eckler? That's like, that's like Brady to James White, but on steroids. Where would you take Austin Eckler if Brady lands on the tractors? Oh, shit. If I had the 101, I wouldn't pass because he's not coming back to me. <laughs> yeah, so look, guys, it's it's a pretty interesting opportunity there. We're, it's really going to be important to see who lands there uh, from a quarterback perspective. If it's Tom Brady, goddamn Austin Eckler stonks is through the goddamn roof. It's Anybody but crazy. Herbert, and I'm, I'm set. Yeah, and, you know, like you said, I think A.J. Dillon's definitely possible. I think Carlos Hyde is possible, you know, to kind of just get that thumper in there. And I would love that because Carlos Hyde is not a threat to Austin Eckler as in terms of his talent, in terms of his ability, in terms of anything on the football field, to be quite honest with you. So I think those are the guys that you want. You want them to add a thumper, and then you know that Austin Eckler is going to have that very efficient pass-catching role and then also get a lot of work on the ground as well. And that's like the, that's the exact type of scat back I target, right? So I basically fade scat backs like 100% of the time, and the only time I invest in them is when I think they have a shot to lead on the ground as well. Because that's where you really get the money, money touches. Yeah, and I'm sure it's the case with a lot of other teams too. I'm just a little bit more tapped in because it's the Chargers. But like Anthony Lynn, as a former running backs coach, is like so vocal about loving Austin Eckler. In 2018, he changed his tune a bit. Like he's like, oh, this guy's a special teamer. We can't use him all the time. But this past year, he showed he could carry the load. He loves the guy. It looks like that he built the offense more around him this season because they knew Melvin Gordon was holding out. And they were cooking before Melvin Gordon came mm-hmm. back. Obviously, with a full offseason of him being – the guy or at least the one be there uh, heading into it I think this offense again is going to look really good and they're going to use him on the ground the way they should out in space and then use him as a receiver a lot so I think you know if you could get him for a late first I don't know I would take that in a heartbeat because I think you know he's 24 years old he's in a pretty decent offense that has shown historically they want to use running backs out of the passing game maybe it's a little hometown cooking but I take him over basically all but three or four running backs in this class no, I'm 100% with you. I was already, like, kind of on that page. Like, I was already had him as, like, the RB5 behind, like, three or four rookies. Um, and I think, you know, I'm willing to pay that, you know, mid-first now. Um, but I think I think you can wait to see who they sign or who they add via rookie to get a little bit of a value value discount. Yeah, if they bring in A.J. Dillon and people start talking about how he's an athletic freak, he's going to take right over, that, that mid-first becomes a late-first and it's a lot more reasonable yep. to buy him. So, yeah, yep, I agree with exactly. you. Right now probably isn't the best time, especially – because he just signed with the team and Melvin Gordon hasn't left yet. But as the offseason goes along and people start getting bored of having the same player on their roster, they'll be looking to ship them off. Definitely. Next up, we put this team on here. We put Detroit Lions. And the reason why I put them on there is just because, you know, Karen Johnson is still yet to play a healthy season. And, you know, we hate slapping injury-prone labels on people. Um, but, you know, his injury history does go back quite a bit. I'm not going to say he's injury-prone yet. But, you know, it's a risk, and I'm sure it's something in the minds of the Lions staff. And more importantly, Matt Patricia, again, just tries to copy everything Belichick does, and all he just, like, forces it into a committee. Like, in the first year, Carrion Johnson was incredibly efficient as a passer, was a great, uh, great receiver. Sorry, not passer, as a receiver. So, you know, he showed that three-down skill sets. And then when they cut uh, – what's his name? Uh, when the they order. cut that – yeah, when they cut Theoretic this year, everyone's like, oh, my God, Karen Johnson's a three-down back. So what did Patricia do? feeds carry on all the in between the tackle grinding carries and then doesn't give many targets. So it's just incredibly frustrating. But what do they have? They have McKissick, who's a restricted free agent. 
Uh, I'm not sure if they bring him back because they do have Ty Johnson, who has a very similar skill set. He would free up about 80 opportunities. They got Bo Scarborough and then Ty Johnson in the backfield. So that's about 267 touches total already right there, right? That's kind of up for the grabs because these guys are all Jags in my opinion. Um, they have all of their rookie picks and they have top 10 in cap space. So like to me, I think there's a good chance the Lions actually invest in a rookie pick. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, looking at their picks again, they have early picks because their team is pretty garbage. As you said, the coaching isn't great. They have 335, 67, 109. I think what we've seen, you know, bringing in CJ Anderson, having LeGarrette Blunt there, with Karen Johnson, they're probably going to look for one of those big grinding running backs. So I won't be surprised if like a Peyton Barber lands there. As for rookies, look at anybody over 230 pounds and basically pencil them in as a fifth round pick. I still <laughs> think Karen Johnson's a very good running back, but what they've shown so far is that they don't tr- they do trust him as a workhorse, but I don't think Karen Johnson can be trusted as a workhorse. And I think you know this season they're going to probably look into that and try to split the load a little bit with him being receiving back. So yeah, I expect the committee this year. If they don't add anything through the free agency and through the draft, I'm not just shooting Carryon Johnson up my draft boards because this team isn't a great running team for as long as I can remember. I, like, I don't even remember the last good Lions running back. Barry Sanders. <laughs> All right, yeah, I wasn't even alive. Like, it was Joyke Bell in, like, 2010 or something or, like, Javon oh, yeah, Best for one season. Like, they just historically haven't run the ball well for the past 35 years. So, yeah, I'm not – Honestly, if they don't invest in anybody through free agency or the draft, I think it's a prime time to sell him because yeah. people think that he's still the guy from his rookie year when we've seen two years straight. Like, he could prove me wrong. He could be healthy for an entire season. But even then, what's his touchdown upside looking like on a Detroit Lions-led offense? Is he going to be used consistently? Like, there's so many holes and so many questions in his game there that, you know, if you could just ship him off for a mid to late first, if they don't add anybody through free agency or the draft, I'm 100% doing that. Yeah. 100% agree with you. I, I mean, I didn't think I would say this because I remember in this rookie year, I'm like, let's get carry on a workhorse role. But I would almost be happy if they reverted back to that type of split where like carry on did a lot of the third down work, got some work on the ground, and they brought in like a thumper to kind of like take some of the bruising off of him. I yeah, like rookie year, he was so efficient. He was basically like an Aaron Jones without the goal line yeah. work. And I'm fine with that for where he's priced right now. But if they use him as a workhorse, is he going to break down? So I don't, there's a lot of questions there and I'm just not fully bought in. Yeah. All right. Next up, we got established the run Seattle Seahawks uh, led by Pete Gumtrue and Carroll and Brian Schittenheimer. Um, bad for NFL, but good for fantasy running backs. Um, so we put them on here. Obviously, they still have Carson. They still have Penny, who they invested a inexplicably invested a first round pick in uh, a couple of years ago. But they're both injured, right? I mean, they're probably going to miss a lot of the training camp time. And the interesting thing here that I noticed is. They have two second round picks. So they have a first round pick, two second round picks, a comp third round pick. And there's a lot of buzz on the NFL media talking head saying that they're making a guarantee that the Seahawks are going to draft the running back. And, you know, that second round is kind of where you could expect to land someone like Cam Akers, who really fits that bruising style that they like. I mean, he's a more athletic Chris Carson who can catch passes, right? So I think that's a very realistic possibility. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's a beautiful spot for a Cam Akers. They have picks 59 and 64 overall. So basically back to back and probably not many teams are going to be spending running backs there. So they might just pass at 59 and see what's left at 64. I wouldn't be surprised if Cam Akers is there at the back half of the second round. I would love that spot for him. Russell Wilson wants to be able to throw to a running back out of the backfield. He hasn't had anybody that can do it. Uh, you know, that J.D. McKissick here and there, who's basically a wide receiver. They had C.J. Procise, who we thought was like actually a real thing. <laughs> He wasn't. So I like that landing spot. Honestly, I'd want them to wait and just take Antonio Gibson. That would be like my dream if Gibson went to the Seahawks. But as you said, they basically are playing hospital ball in the backfield right now. And Pete Carroll has shown he wants to use, you know, a first round pick on a running back for however stupid that is. That's just what he wants to do. I can't blame the dude. He's like 75 and he looks 50. So something's working for him. Maybe it's early round running backs. Maybe he's not stressing about analytics and that's why he looks so young. So yeah, I wouldn't put it past them to spend one of those second round picks on a back. I could see a workhorse role, but even then, like if it's a committee, there's still so much volume in that backfield so that it's basically a workhorse role. Like Chris Carson yeah. and the rookie running back can both get 15 touches a game and be, you know, mid RB twos. And I'm perfectly fine with that. Yeah. We're talking about 440 to 450 touches, right? That's a lot of touches. And, you know, Carson has all again, just someone that just has not been able to stay healthy 
for his entire career. He's ended every single season on the IR or injured. It was like a hip and ankle yeah. and something else. It's it's crazy yeah. at this point. And he's getting a bit older, so you know, team established the run is going to have to really fill that running back role to to really you know ground and pound and run out the clock. So who better do that than Cam Akers? All right, next up, the everyone's top spot for a landing spot for running backs, and we're sorry to be the Debbie Downers, but let's just dive into it. It's the Kansas City Chiefs. They have McCoy, most likely leaving, who's vacating about 135 targets. But they still have our boy Dame. I know everyone likes to shit on him. I don't really get it. Like, I don't think he's elite, but I think he's, you know, better than good enough. And definitely at least good enough. for the Chiefs offense. Like, all you need to do is be able to catch passes and run decently, and you're good. Yeah. And he's explosive, right? Like, you know, people like to write off his big plays but like like, dude that's part of his game right like i don't see anyone saying well if we take away barkley's top runs of 20 plus yards then he would be like a shady running back like no that's I not did how that it last works, season, right? like, so don't say nobody <laughs> <laughs> all right well you're fired but uh <laughs> basically the chiefs they have negative cap space right now we know they're about to pay mahomes a billion dollars because they should he's the best player i've ever seen and you know they're just like it doesn't make sense right like they they have a super bowl winning team a formula and they don't need to invest a top pick in a running back. So I just I just don't see someone like Swift or Dobbins uh, really landing there. What I see is more likely is maybe in the fourth round they grab someone like Keyshawn Vaughn, right? Like that could be a possibility. Someone like Eno Benjamin. But for all intents and purposes, they've picked up their option on Dame. You know, they seem committed to him. And if he stays healthy, which is the question mark because he hasn't been able to do so. But if when he was healthy, he was good, man. Like so, like what, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think like there's gonna be an opportunity here for a rookie running back? I think if anything in the later rounds, like you said, I mean, this team just won the Super Bowl and Damian Williams was in and out of the lineup basically the entire regular season. And they were making it work with a mixture of Daryl Williams, LaShawn McCoy, and like Darwin Thompson for like four carries in the season, despite him being like an eighth round redraft pick. But like, there's no reason for them to invest in a running back, a position that doesn't really turn the needle or move the needle for an actual NFL team. Just invest in the offensive line, invest in defense, make this team just a contender for year after year. They have picks 32, 63, 96. At 96, maybe they take a shot on a guy like Keyshawn Vaughn, like you said. And if that's the case, for redraft, or for, for redraft, I wouldn't be high on him. For dynasty, that's decent because Damian Williams, what they extended him for one more year. After yep. that, they could just hand over the keys and Keyshawn Vaughn could play a very similar role. He had a very good combine showing. He's a decent pass catcher. He ran a 4-5-1, so that could be you know, stonks yep. up for him for dynasty purposes redraft i know this isn't a redraft show but like damien williams is still gonna be the guy unless they make a huge change they have no money to pay another running back there and with their picks like it, it just doesn't make sense to pick a running yeah, back as make high sense. as they would need to to get a good one yeah so we, we basically project for nothing happening there i think they're going to sign dame they're going to bring back their guys probably take a late round flyer you know maybe that fourth fifth round pick and then redrafters and Kansas City running back hyper is going to push that guy into the eighth round of redraft leagues just like they did Darwin Thompson. So make sure you don't make sure you don't follow the herd on that one. But it, I like I think we're going to be able to get Dame Williams at a pretty good discount this year. And that's going to be someone that I'm going to be clicking on in redraft and even in dynasty for contending teams. Yeah, one thing. Next up is the Buccaneers have signed Tom Brady. It's a done deal. Woo! That is ridiculous. Man, that is ridiculous. What do you, I did what not do you think that does? Tom to ever live in Florida, but here we are. Do you think that's a uh, – I mean, we kind of cover this. What do you think that means for, like, Godwin and Evans? I mean, Godwin – people are, like, nervous about Godwin. Doesn't Tom Brady love peppering the slot? Isn't that his thing? Like, why would that yep. be bad for Godwin? For Evans, Evans is still a really fucking good wide receiver. <laughs> what was it, two years ago, Brandon Cooks was a fringe wide receiver one there, and Mike Evans yep. is twice yep. the player that Brandon Cooks is. So, like, I don't know. People are so worried about it. Sure, his arm isn't the same, but I, I think he's a good and smart enough player to use Mike Evans in a way that's going to return fantasy value. Maybe it's not a 1,500-yard, 12-touchdown season, but if you're hoping for that with any quarterback, like you're shooting a bit too high. I could easily see like 1,208 next year, and I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. I totally, totally agree with you. This is probably the best wide receiver corp that he has ever played with, right? Um, so I think it's going to be good for him. And it's also, you know, interesting to note, like OJ Howard, right? Now it's Tom Brady versus Bruce Arians, the battle of the tight end lovers versus the tight end haters to see what comes out on top. But I tweeted that out like a while ago when they were talking about bringing him there. It's like, are they going to arm wrestle to decide if they use a tight end <laughs> or not? Because that's like completely opposite. It's like that meme with those two people like grabbing hands or whatever, except they're actually arm <laughs> yeah. wrestling and not joining together. <laughs> yeah. And I think the interesting thing, you know, people always talk about arm strength and, you know, whether Brady still has it. I think he still has arm strength. You know, 
I remember reading about this in an interview or in an article or something. It was like Dan Marino or if it was like Troy Aikman. Like a lot of these like Hall of Fame quarterbacks, they all said they could still throw today, but it's their legs that go first. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's all about whether or not – and we know Tom's pretty nimble, right? He's not a running quarterback, but in the pocket, he's about, you know, as good and savvy as they come. So I'm pretty hopeful. I think I'm, I'm willing to buy low on Mike Evans here if anyone's selling him for that low. Um, Do you also yeah, think like – Mike Evans is catching 70 air yard or balls that travel 70 yards in the air every single game. Tom Brady doesn't <laughs> yeah. have to throw 50, 60, yeah. 70 yard bombs. It could be like a 15 yard pass on Mike Evans houses. Like you don't have to have a cannon arm to be great. Jameis Winston just threw 30 interceptions. He is not a good quarterback. <laughs> he wasn't even accurate on the deep throws that he made. I'll take Tom yeah. Brady with less arm strength over Jameis Winston any day of the week. And if that, if it, things end up, being wrong that analysis comes back to bite me guess what it's march so you guys won't even remember this <laughs> all right all right back to the back to the main show we got 49ers this is actually one of my top spots for running backs unfortunately my dreams were quashed as i did the research on them they originally only had one first round pick but luckily yesterday they acquired an additional pick by trading uh buckner so that'll be good for their draft capital but they're you know bottom 10 in the league in cap space you know, again, they were one quarter away from winning the Super Bowl with Raheem Mostert, Matt Breda, and Tevin Coleman as the running backs. So I just, again, I just don't see them investing in early round pick. Maybe they trade back and co- acquire a couple more picks and add someone that way. But, you know, I think for our purposes, Coleman, uh, who was trash, by the way, so stop. Anyone who thinks Coleman is good, like, as soon as he had the big game, I was like, dude, sell him. He's just not a good running back. I think he's out. Uh, they can cut him for basically zero impact to their cap space. And he can't stay healthy, and he's just not good. So I think he's gone. Breda is a restricted free agent. Good chance they bring him back because Breda is actually good, but, again, just not healthy. Uh, and then we have Raheem Mostert. So I think Mostert's like a pretty decent uh, dart throw right now, you know, in case they don't add anyone via the draft. Like, What do you think about that? Yeah, I just thought they restructured Jarek McKinnon's contract too. So it looks like they want to keep him around unless they just want to cut him and they wanted to like do something with the dead cap that I don't know about. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like Mostert a lot. The thing is, he's a bit older and you're probably only getting one year tops out of him. Mm-hmm. And even then, this team has shown that they want to be a running back by committee. Kyle Shanahan has always kind of run like that. And this yep. year, Mostert was very good. But as you said, Matt Breda was hurt a lot of the season. He was good in the beginning of the season until he wasn't and he got hurt. Tevin Coleman as well was the main guy. Even Jeffrey Wilson got his snaps before Raheem Mostert did. So I just don't think you could pencil him in to be a complete workhorse there. Now, as Mike was saying, they got a new early round pick there. We kind of expect like a C.D. Lamb, and I think that they are losing their center through free agency. I need to look into their offensive line a bit more because I think Kyle Shanahan wants to have a really good offensive line. He's always kind of built from the inside out. Uh, so mm-hmm. I think they picked 31 also, so maybe they invest somewhere there. But if not, I wouldn't be surprised if they just pick, they trade that 31st pick back and maybe invest in the running back that way because this is a team that's basically built around the run. And through George Kittle and Debo Samuel, I think it's a really good offense. And I think that they just need that final young piece out of the backfield to be complete. Jimmy Garoppolo isn't a fantastic quarterback, but if he has somebody out of the backfield and he has those two weapons that are versatile in Kittle and Samuel, you don't have to be the best quarterback to make another Super Bowl run. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, you brought up an interesting point. We have him tagged as a potential committee opportunity, but not all committees are created equal. San Francisco 49ers had like 500 plus touches out of the running back last year which is just insane so even if you're part of that committee you're getting something like coleman and bredo alone accounted for 300 touches like that is a workhorse role in itself so there's a lot of good opportunities to be snatched up there i don't think most is a workhorse either but if he does retain the lead role and i think him getting back late also has to do a little bit with i think he broke his arm last year right so he was coming off injury as well oh yeah um, i remember that he like snapped path. in half in 20 yeah that was it was a pretty gruesome injury so but when he was on the field he was absolutely fantastic so i'm rooting for him i love rooting for the underdog, underdog stories so hopefully uh he's able to train something be on the lookout for them to potentially trade back now that they have two first round picks the opportunity is kind of there whereas before that door was kind of closed shut next up this is an exciting opportunity. The Atlanta Falcons, they're making some, I don't know, I can't really understand a lot of the moves they're making I right now. I believe and they, still... they traded a second for Hayden Hurst. When you guys said that on the show yesterday, I'm like, <laughs> a, a second? I thought it was a fifth, and they threw in a two. That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, so they just gave them a second round pick. They used to have two second round picks, which was like even more exciting because, again, puts them in that Cam Akers, J.K. Dobbins uh, territory. 
but this is one of the premier landing spots because it's one of the workhorse rolls back because Freeman just got cut as expected. He vacates about 254 opportunities, probably more because he was injured. So if you prorate that for a full 16 games, you're probably looking at like 280. And you got Hill, who's just a jag. And then you got Smith, who's also a jag. So there's about 382 opportunities in that backfield up for the grab. So if you assume someone walks into like a 70% roll, you're looking at a workhorse back. A lot of targets to be up uh, to be taken. I would love Cam Makers to land here. It would be the perfect fit for them, in my opinion. He's great out of the backfield. He can pass pro. He's a three down threat, and he's really going to provide that weaponry for Matt Ryan. What do you think? Yeah, he's been linked there a lot, and they still have the 55th overall pick. That's like a prime spot to select Cam Makers. Looking at the situation as a whole, their offensive line last year was 24th in adjusted line yards, so they weren't great but they aren't losing anybody to free agency. There's no unrestricted free agents along that offensive line. So at least there's going to be continuity there, whereas a lot of the league is shaking up a bit, which I weigh pretty heavily. You know, keeping the same unit year over year is probably going to get better while everybody else is changing. The other thing is they don't necessarily target the running backs a ton. But again, they have so much volume in their offense with Dirk Cutter there that, you know, if they throw the ball 650 times a season, a 10% clip means six, 65 passes are going to the running backs. And looking at yep. their percentages recently, Cutter has been at 17, 14, 16, and 15% for the running backs. And Matt Ryan, before Cutter got there, was 19.5, 19.9, 16.8, and then 13.8, which was pretty low. But you have to also realize they haven't had, like, an incredible pass catcher. Devonta Freeman was serviceable there. He's not a true weapon. Cam Akers isn't really a weapon either, but I think he can definitely develop into that because he showed a ton of flashes at FSU. Uh, he stays close to home if he goes there. And, I, yeah, that's just a great landing spot for him. Yeah. I think he could take over a true workhorse role. I don't know if you heard this, but uh, you know who has a bad offensive line? No, I didn't. And I heard the uh, offensive lines don't matter. Can you please tell me? Uh, Cam Akers. He had a bad offensive line. So I'm sure he'll kind of fit in there. Fit in there just Where are your stats fine. to pick that up? <laughs> I don't have the stats, man. It's just opinions out here. All right. That's an exciting opportunity. That's arguably, in my opinion, that is the top landing spot for running backs. It's right the now, most realistic is. one too. Like obviously, San Francisco and the Chiefs are the top landing spots, but the top yeah. one that's actually realistic would be the Falcons because it's a workhorse yeah. and they have a realistic shot at taking a rookie. Yeah, exactly. All right, the last one we're not going to spend too much time on. We just added on here because Noah kept bringing them up as a landing spot, and I've heard other people do it too. Um, but it's the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, so we think that there is a potential committee opportunity here. You know, you got Benny Snell and Jalen Samuels accounting for 235 touches. James Conner, obviously never healthy either. But if he's healthy, I think he's still got the role because, again, they have negative cap space and they only have a second round and third round pick. And the third is a comp. So, look, they don't have much capital. They don't have much salary space. I don't think anything's happening here. Like, what do you think? Yeah, they have the 49th pick, and then they don't have a pick until past 100. So I don't see them taking a running back of note. I just It's the same for Carry on Johnson with me. It's like if they make it out of this free agency and draft period without a running back, James Conner's value is going to increase because people are going to think that they have confidence in him being a workhorse back. I'm not so sure after ending three seasons injured and on injured reserve, I think for two of them, that they have complete faith in him being a true workhorse back. So I think that's potential to sell. I, I remember back in the, the Lions portion, I said to sell Karrion Johnson for a late first if they don't get anybody through the draft. Obviously, those rookie picks will be gone after the draft, so that was kind of <laughs> stupid to say. But you could sell him for maybe a package of like an RB2 and a wide receiver 2 or something if they're, they're expecting a top 12 running back at a James Conner win. He's on the field. He's really good. But historically, we've just seen he can't stay on the field and you can't trust him You know, during that playoff run when you really need a, a workhorse back that's going to give you a solid floor week after week. Yeah, I'm on board with that. I'm actually, after looking at this analysis, I'm willing to buy him right now because he's really, really cheap. And a lot of people flip still him think, in two months, just play yeah, the market. A lot of people That's still think that that he's gonna that they're gonna land someone. I don't think they will. So I'm gonna buy him now, and then you know, after one or two weeks of performance in the season, I'll probably look to sell then. That's gonna be my path for James Conner. Very um, smart. So that kind of wraps up the running back uh, landscape. We hope that was helpful for you. But just to give you a quick summary, basically we identified nine potential committee jobs and three workhorse jobs. There's one workhorse available in free agency still. That's Melvin Gordon. And there's about four committee backs available through free agency. Actually three now because Jordan Howard's gone. So Peyton Barber, uh, Carlos Hyde, and potentially Matt Breda. So what that really means is – 
we have about two potential workhorse roles and that's the Buccaneers and the Falcons available. So when you're looking at those rookie picks and everyone's valuing the top four running backs as workhorse running backs, I would really like, you know, kind of like temper those expectations a little bit. Not to say that, you know, in one year or two years, they don't win that job, but you know, you want to draft guys that can produce for you right away. So I would really temper expectations because you're looking at two workhorse roles and maybe like three or four committee roles remaining after all the other guys sign. Yeah, one team we took off the list was actually the Titans because they brought back Derrick Henry, but it's a franchise tag, so he's there for one year. And I was telling Mike, I wouldn't be surprised if at pick 29, if he's still there, they go for Jonathan Taylor. I mean, don't forget we saw DeMarco Murray be there for two years, and then they drafted Derrick Henry in the second round to play second fiddle and then eventually take over that role. I think coming out of college, Jonathan Taylor is a better prospect than Derrick Henry. He's a better pass catcher than he was so I think that could be realistic that they would just want to use like a two-headed monster back there to start off in his rookie year and then just fully hand over the reins I mean we saw this team make it very far in the playoffs just leaning on their run game imagine them having those two guys back there like they're not thrown to the running backs anyways you could just run 40 times a game control the clock and just win like 13 to 7 every single week I mean, that's definitely possible, man. And also, you know, there's a chance that Derrick Henry holds out, right? I mean, this guy is a rushing champion, and he probably thinks he deserves all the world. And the Twitter Twitterverse says that Derrick Henry carried them to the playoffs, right? So, look, there's, there's a chance. A lot of things that can happen still, guys, and just be on the lookout. But I would definitely still say temper those expectations because even if he does land there, right, you're still, you still got to be patient. You're looking at like a Nick Chubb type, type emergence where he has to kind of take over the reins eventually. And if that happens in the beginning of the season, you draft like a Jonathan Taylor in the beginning of the season, he's playing second fiddle. That's a prime time to buy. Like so many people get nervous about players not developing in dynasty because they don't get a role right away. There's a reason yeah. why you keep these players forever. It's because you wait for them to eventually get that role. If anybody was selling Nick Chubb because he wasn't t- like taking touches from Carlos Hyde in the first five weeks of the season and they had friggin' Hugh Jackson coaching and you were nervous about that, like, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I would just say hold him no matter what. He's one of those players that even if he lands in a terrible landing spot and it's not deemed a, a workhorse role based on our analysis, I wouldn't be worried that he just doesn't yeah. take over and get 300 touches as a rookie anyways. Yeah, one of the best prospects. But yeah, hope that's helpful, guys. Um, just really, really want to set level set expectations for rookie hype. Breaking news. The Colts are on the verge of signing former Chargers quarterback Phillip <laughs> Rivers. Rest in peace, Indy. That is, that is something. I can't believe it. Look, at least on the bright side, uh, I mean, Rivers got a noodle arm, but at least he throws deep. That's better than Jacoby Brissett, who doesn't even attempt it. So I mean, he throws deep, like, but it doesn't go to his team. <laughs> yeah, I mean, most of the time they goes to the opposing defense, but that's at least the opportunity might be there. But T.Y. Hilton stonks definitely down. If, yeah, uh, he might be in the hospital with those balls that he's throwing. Yeah. What I will say, though, is it provides a cell window for Paris Campbell. I'm not a big Paris Campbell believer, and everyone thinks that because Paris Campbell is like super athletic and fast and Rivers likes to throw the short under routes, uh, they are going to be buying on him. Like, if, if people in your league believe that, I would definitely be looking to sell Paris Campbell for, like, a second-round pick. Yeah, if you can get a second-round pick from him, I would do that. Like, last year, I was pretty high on him because of the athleticism, but if you look at his profile and the analytics community or whatever, like, he isn't an elite prospect. The fact that he missed his entire rookie season basically doesn't bode well for him. Now he's going through a QB change, and he's probably going to go through another one soon because Philip Rivers stinks. Like, I don't know. Things aren't looking good in Indy. I don't know why they would do such a thing when they're, like, kind of a, not a rebuilding team, but a younger team. They bring in, like, a 38-year-old quarterback. So, yeah, it makes um, no sense to me. Are we going to do your O-line stuff? Yeah, just quickly covering uh, some offensive line potential movements. I mean, we saw last year, right, the importance of offensive linemen is huge like the Oakland Raiders brought in two guys and Richie Incognito who wasn't in the league and then Trent Brown at right tackle their offensive line was very good last year Um, Andrew Whitworth a few seasons ago when he left the uh, Cincinnati Bengals and he went to the Rams their offensive line looked awesome but then last year when they let go of Roger Saffold they went back to a shit show so offensive linemen aren't really appreciated in fantasy football because they don't get you points but it's a huge part of running backs productions and a few big name guys this year that are highly ranked among PFF's grading system are Jason Peters, the left tackle for the Philadelphia Eagles. He was a sixth rated tackle. If he's gone, then you might as well like rent out a thousand hospital beds for Carson Wentz, because I'm not so sure that any other left tackle can keep him healthy. Uh, Andrew Whitworth, who I just mentioned before, he's about 40 years old. And so is Jason Peters. He was a sixth highest ranked pass blocking tight end. So that could be a big move. Uh, A few other guys I'll just run through quick. Brian Bulaga isn't expected to be back in green Bay. Jack Conklin went from the Tennessee Titans to the Cleveland Browns. Cleveland Huge. is a sneaky good team. They still have money to 
acquire a left tackle if there are any more on the market. As for what it does with Tennessee, Tennessee still has a really good offensive line, but obviously losing a piece as good as him is going to hurt, especially in the run game. He was the sixth highest ranked run blocking uh, tackle. Other guys, Greg Van Roten for Carolina. Uh, Graham Glasgow got moved. Richie Incognito is a free agent. Ben Garland, the center for San Francisco. And Connor McGovern, who is the center for the, I believe the Broncos, but they just brought in Glam. Graham Glasgow so those are a few big name guys I obviously don't have much analysis behind it other than their grades but if you see these names on Twitter start getting moved I'd say closer to the season start looking into the offensive line landscape and changes that were made because that's a huge part that not many people look into and it has a big impact on running ability for running backs because it's such a it's a position that's super dependent on the surrounding area and obviously the trenches of where it all starts. Yeah, I just, uh, I mean, I did a little bit of a study on offensive lines and, you know, common sense dictates that it matters, but I like to put numbers to context. So based on the football outsiders rankings of the uh, top five running back finishes, 64% of them had a top 10 ranked offensive line Uh, of the top 12 RBs, 51% had a top 10 offensive line. So the takeaway there is that while not having a good O-line is, is not necessarily a kiss of death because you have guys like, you know, Eckler and CMC that have mediocre lines that do really well. But having a bad O-line is a really big red flag. It's really hard, you know, if you think of like, you know, the David Montgomery's and, and those are the people of the world. So you really want to be careful because like, you know, it's really hard to separate the two, but you really want someone that has like at least a pretty decent O-line if you're looking for a top 12 RB finish. I would really avoid... Um, trying to invest in guys with like really really garbage lines it's not yeah this past year for the draft guide I actually looked into that as well and I basically said a bunch of guys that I was a little bit lower on because of offensive line play was Dalvin Cook who I was completely wrong about but then like Le'Veon Bell Melvin Gordon uh, I think yeah Joe Mixon as well and there's one or David Johnson also like you basically hit on a lot of those guys whether it was purely because of the offensive line no but like it's a good place to start looking because I think it was over the last 10 years, there's only been like three running backs that have finished as top five producers, despite running behind a bottom five offensive line. I think it was like yep. Adrian Peterson and like Marshawn Lynch. So it was like legitimately awesome running backs that you probably aren't going to fade for the offensive line anyways. Yeah. So one person to look out for that is Fournette. Everyone's looking for a bounce back here for Fournette. Their O-line is still trash. They're basically selling. They're having a fire sale over there. I wouldn't be shocked if he holds out as well. They gave up Um, Blaze Campbell for like a fifth and they gave up AJ Boye for like a kiss on the cheek. I don't know. Yeah. I think anyone that has Fournette in their top 10 ranks is going to be disappointed on on that one. That's a huge fade for me. Um, All right. That kind of wraps up the main content. We're going to jump into the narrative. Before we do that, let's plug the discord. Let's plug the draft guide. Big Dogs Draft Guide dropping April 1st. It's no joke. We got a bunch of, I think we have 50 player write-ups. We're going to add more if guys like from last year, McCole Hardman, uh, get drafted very high that weren't even on our radar. We also have other exclusive content, like Mike's working on a startup type of guide. We're talking about late-round draft picks that you guys could steal in the third and fourth round of your, in your rookie drafts. We're going to have mock draft exclusive videos, just bunch of good content you can go on i think it's bigdogsdraftguide.com slash mkf mm-hmm. there's the link on the top of the screen you can get both guides for ten dollars it's a ridiculous deal because it's usually like 50 to 60 bucks there's a ton of analysis in there you guys are going to love it i guarantee it or your money back but i'm not going to give you your money back so i just guarantee it with no money back because you're going to love it mike i'm not so sure if you feel the same way i hope you do but i think, Dude, I think the analysis we're spitting in there is pretty good the analysis is fire the jokes are fire we got excellent content. You know, we're making fun of Noah's bunk beds, Nick's relationship with Zendaya. Dude, we got everything in there, guys. Just head on there, check it out. Ten bucks, you cannot go wrong. Trust me on this. Uh, I put my I put my money and my reputation on it for sure. Nice. Well, I have no money to put on. My reputation isn't good anyway, so I can say the same <laughs> thing. Uh, on top of that, the Discord. We were gonna cut it out, cut it off at five hundred people, and then make it exclusive to Patreon members. We said. Fuck that noise. We're for the people out here. <laughs> We're extending it to we don't know how many, but it's still open. So we'll put the descri- we'll put the link to the Discord in the description. We'll pin the comment. If you guys want to join, it's completely free right now. We have like 20 channels teaching you guys how to start up a Dynasty League as well as an outlet to put you guys into Dynasty Leagues with others. On top of that, we will review some trades. We will review your roster and potential roster moves. And after the actual NFL draft, Mike and I will start breaking down those trades and rosters on, on video for you guys to get direct feedback. And I think it'll be helpful for everybody because if you're joining the league through there, 
the league settings are going to be basically uniform for everybody unless your league wants to change it. Obviously, we're not like telling you exactly what to do. But I think uh, you guys having similar league format will help you guys when we break down trades and roster advice because it'll probably apply to you who will be in a very similar situation. So sign up for that. It's a lot of fun. We have a meme channel that I mute because you guys are just <laughs> that shit with a million text messages every single second. But it's a good time. We have a bunch of people in there. We're all pretty friendly. And if you're not, I might just have to pull out that ban and get you going. Yeah, it's uh, I, honestly, man, it, it's grown incredibly fast. Like just in the past week, we've up to like over 500 members. So it's going to be one of the biggest dynasty communities out there. So just get in there, man. It's free. It doesn't cost you nothing. It's a damn good time. So make sure you get on that. One last thing. Stonks down for Darren Waller. They just brought in Jason Witten. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, Christ. my God. He's a grinder, man. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right. Well, that's bad for Waller. But, I mean, <laughs> Waller's still way better. I'm still fine with buying Waller, I think. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that they just have, like, a connection for, like, narrating and commentating games. And they just want to have, like, John Gruden and Jason Witten just retire <laughs> from football and go back up in the booth. Yeah, I will not be watching that show. So... <laughs> Uh, all right, next up, we got this week's narrative. Hit it. This week's narrative. Just because you're in a super flex league, you must draft a quarterback first. So I put out my top 12 super flex rookie draft rankings this week, and I had Jonathan Taylor at 101. And DeAndre Swift at 101 ahead of the quarterbacks. Got a lot of backlash. And a lot of the comments was just like, hey, it's wrong because you have to draft a quarterback first. And, you know, I although I agree that the quarterback position is valued higher, I disagree that you should use, like, a positional lock as drafting in rookie drafts. Because, I mean, if you think back to 2018, right, like Saquon Barkley was unanimously ahead of Baker Mayfield. And I'm not saying Jonathan Taylor and Swift are Barkley, but in terms of the gap between them as prospects and, you know, Burrow and Tua – I think, you know, it's kind of similar, right? Like, what do you think about that? Like, what's your approach? I'll ask you a few trade questions. And you can give me your feedback. Ready? Would yeah. you rather have Mike Evans or Teddy Bridgewater? Mike Evans. Okay. Well, Mike Evans was the 102 in 2014, and Teddy Bridgewater was the second <laughs> taken quarterback behind Johnny Manziel. So those two both aged very well. The 101 <laughs> was Sammy Watkins, so I'm not going to pull the wall. <laughs> there. 2015, Todd Gurley, Amari Cooper, and Melvin Gordon were the consensus 101 through 103. Jameis Winston and Marcus Mariota were the top quarterbacks. 2016, yeah. Ezekiel Elliott versus Carson Wentz and Jared Goff. I think we know the answer there. 2017, <laughs> Leonard Fournette, Christian McCaffrey, and Corey Davis. Uh, we'll throw that under the rug. Uh, <laughs> versus Patrick Mahomes, Mitchell Trubisky. Mitchell Trubisky was going ahead of Deshaun Watson, which is astounding. But even then, if you want to throw Watson in that group, I'm taking McCaffrey at least on par with Mahomes and over Trubisky any day of the week. Uh, on top of I'll take him over Watson, even Leonard Fournette, who is not nearly as good as Christian McCaffrey. It's not like you completely whiffed by taking him over a Patrick Mahomes or he's a top five RB in his rookie yeah, season. It's fine. And then 2018 Saquon Barkley or Baker slash Lamar, even though Lamar has finally shown he's an elite quarterback, like Saquon Barkley is on par. The only year where it's like really the difference is huge is probably this year, but it's also one year out. So we don't know how things are going to trend. It's Kyler versus Josh Jacobs. And even then, it's not like a crazy split. So just to say that you have to take a quarterback because their shelf life is quote-unquote longer and they have a higher and longer peak, like I'm not necessarily sure that's, that's correct. And people don't even want to like take a chance on wide receivers as well. And I'm fine with that because they usually take a long time to break out. But when they hit age 24 and they're producing, you basically have like six, seven seasons of potential wide receiver one production if you get CeeDee Lamb and he hits the way you want him to hit. Like Mike Evans right now, is going into what, like his sixth season, sixth season. Of, of him or seventh being season. basically a wide receiver one? Like, yeah. what else do you want from the guy? Yeah, I mean, how many how many uh, quarterbacks do you think are in the first round of startup ADP right now? I would say four. I think the top two plus uh, Herbert and maybe Jordan Love. That's right. How many running backs do you think are in the top 12 right now? Five. Yep, that's right. Take on Barkley, Christian McCaffrey. Alvin Cook, Ezekiel Elliott, Alvin Kamara. You're on fire here. Oh, yeah, I was talking about like rookies too. So this is crazy because I was thinking like <laughs> rookie picks. All right. No, no, I'm talking startup, startup, uh, startup ADP. So it's pretty and then, crazy. Yeah. And then you have Michael Thomas, DeAndre Hopkins, and Devontae Adams rounding out the wide receivers. So there's more running backs, man, in the top 
in the top part. And like when you're trying to hit on these 101s and 102s, you're you're hoping that Jonathan Taylor's turn into like the Ezekiel Elliott's. And like you brought up a great point about like shelf life versus um, like people talk about shelf life, right? He's like, oh, quarterbacks can play for 15 years, 10 years. Like, dude, I I literally don't give a shit because I'm trading <laughs> my players like after like one or two years anymore. I don't know anybody that's sitting there like you like not, you guys not make trades and like change your teams over the course that's of 10 all I years. Do. Like we we can barely forecast one week in the NFL and people are trying to forecast 10 years. Right. So for me, it's all about chasing the apex of players. That's why whenever someone tries to make the shelf life argument for me, like I just, I literally just don't care because at the end of the day, like we're trying to win. Right. I'm not trying to like outlast the other guy in like, you know, in like a yeah. game of patience. I'm here for a good time. Not a long time. I'm here to win <laughs> yeah. right now. That's, that's my life model, man. Like here for a good time, not for a long time. So you guys got to, you guys got to go for these guys to get the W. And in the end, that's all that fucking matters. Get the win, and you need workhorse running back to win. So I'm firmly planting my flag with Taylor at the top of the rookie class. I know there's some of you closeted running back one overall super flex drafters out there. No need to be in the closet anymore. Just jump out and be proud of me, man, because I'm definitely drafting 101 and never looking back. Yeah, and also touching on peak and longevity, I'm calling him out by name. It's Scott. My boy Scott said I wouldn't do it. I'm going to do it. He was talking about selling Mike Evans because he's 26 or whatever. And he's probably <laughs> joking. And he just wanted me to put this on the show. But if this is like an, uh, a belief that you have that you should sell these receivers because they're 26 and in four years they're going to be 30. And when they're 30, they're dead. Imagine doing that with Julio Jones when he was 26. Imagine doing that with Larry Fitzgerald when he was 26 or 27. Julio Tony Jones Brown. told him at 26, you missed out on an 1,800-yard season, a 1,600-yard season, and three 1,400-yard seasons. You can't just sell because a guy is – like 26 is basically like prime time for a receiver to produce, even though like an Amari Cooper, somebody I don't like, would I be surprised if he puts up like three straight 1200 yard seasons? Hell no, because he's now in a better situation back with the Cowboys. And that's when receivers produce, when they start to build chemistry with these guys and they've been in the league for four or five years. So don't be shying away from selling these guys or don't, don't sell these guys because they're getting up there in age and they're appro approaching year th or age 30 for them. Like, guys still produce at 30 years old, especially if they're in a role that plays a slot a lot. Like, somebody I like to buy right now is Adam Thielen. Obviously, it's probably hard because they just got rid of Stephon Diggs, and people are going to think he's, like, a top five wide receiver in Dynasty, which is – Nah, know, it'll be let, easy, man. Adam I'll Thielen's let, the easiest to buy. Yeah. But, like, honestly, if they add somebody through the draft or through free agency, like, Adam Thielen probably has three to four more years of at least wide receiver two production. And, you know, a month ago I got him, I think, round 11 in a startup. So – don't take age too, too much into consideration if you're a contending team, right? You want to win now, and you want to stock up on these guys who are either in their prime or at least have one or two more years of production. And I think a lot of these older receivers are people you can capitalize on. Like, even this yeah. past year, if you drafted Julian Edelman or you traded for him, like, you're getting fringe wide receiver one production. So just touching yeah. on shelf life, like, it's not always the best option to get a quarterback because you might end up with a Derek Carr or a Marcus Mariota or what's going to be a Jared Goff. Yeah, and Keenan Allen is another name that just you just need to buy because he's in his peak prime. Like 28 to 30 is literally the prime of all primes for wide receivers. So if you're even remotely close to winning, you can get these guys for dirt cheap. I'm definitely all in on all of them. So anyways, that wraps up the narrative for this week. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you guys found it helpful. We'll be back next week with uh, more Big Facts Only. Yeah, I think next week we're doing a live mock draft maybe. So check the Discord. We're only going to post the link in there. I just thought of that so maybe we can plug that a little bit we'll put it in the mock draft channel around i don't know like nine at night probably because mike works to the bone but <laughs> uh we're gonna be having i think was it gonna be 10 other people in the mock draft we're gonna be doing i think early versus late round quarterback strategy and seeing which one works better and giving our analysis throughout the draft so hope you guys enjoyed this video hopefully there's not a ton of news right when we finish recording this like cam newton to the charges james winston to the charges and i can just go to sleep and start crying but uh, as it stands right now that's that's all we got so i hope you guys enjoyed and peace peace